Hello, everyone. This is the Faithful Life Podcast. I'm Matt Jacobson of FaithfulMan.com. And I'm Lisa Jacobson of Club31Women.com. We're so glad you're here with us. At Faithful Life, we explore what it means to be a biblical Christian in today's world, in our marriage, parenting, church, and culture. It's real, raw, and relevant. So let's get started. Hey, everyone. Hello. Hey, we're back in the saddle after a great family family vacation together. Yeah, we had so much fun. Our older kids all flew in from across the country, and we spent over a week together just playing in Central Oregon. Yeah, a lot of fun. In fact, if some of you follow us on uh, Instagram, you can see Lisa at Club 31 Women, and I'm at at Faithful Man, and you probably saw some of our stories on there. And I don't know, there might be a few more in the next little... Little bit, but. Yeah, we floated the river and played in the lakes and went hiking. It was it was just a really lovely yeah, time. Super great time. And now we're back in the swing of things and uh, looking forward to have a great week just getting started. And we're going to start with a serious, serious topic for believers. Yeah, that's right. We're going to talk about faith, real faith that comes when times of real crisis hit. Absolutely. And the fact of the matter, life is going to dish out a crisis of some magnitude to you, some small, some medium, some large. But we tend not to plan for those, do we? We mm-hmm. just think in terms of, you know, this life that we have is a life that is under God's blessing, under his favor, and he has his best in mind for us. And we don't really think in terms of the crises that we face as part of that. They really are enemies in a lot of ways. And our expectation is that nothing bad will happen as we go about our day, our week, our month, or year. But that's not really the way it is. Well, and I think it's normal not to want bad things to happen. Yeah, I mean, no, of course. We know we're made for something more that when things are off, they're, they're just not how they're supposed to be. That's true. Because you know, we are spiritual beings and, you know, we can hear that distant truth in our soul that we were made for something other than the challenges, the difficulties, the tragedies, and the heartaches of this life. So in, in one sense, you know, all of the worst things that we experience, they're not really normal mm-hmm. because we know that they're an affront to a life that – the life in the garden, really. All, all of the worst things in life are an affront to that life in Eden. And yet the scriptures are filled with reminders that we as believers are going to have difficulties in this life. So for those of you who are listening, I just wanted to ask, are you facing a faith-challenging season? And what was your faith then or is it now? Hmm. Well, this is where we find out whether our faith is real or just something that we claim to have, right? When the sky is blue and the sun's shining and everything's going well, that is not the test of our faith. It's really in those valleys, in those crisis moments where we find out the connection between what we say we believe and what we actually believe. Yeah. I mean, do you believe God is truly with you in the storm? Do you have confidence that he actually cares about you in your circumstances? <laughs> right. You know, because often our circumstances are absolutely screaming at us that God doesn't really care, that he's not really concerned, that he's not paying attention, that he's not mindful of where I'm at. That's what our flesh says. That's what our circumstances say. And for everybody out there, Lisa and I have a circumstance in our life. We've walked the path of tremendous uh, tragedy, tremendous trauma. Mm -hmm. We want to share that story with you. We want to share our own journey with you. And maybe some of you can identify with this. And if you haven't had a major trauma in your life, perhaps this will be something that God can use as a reminder of, uh, of his grace and goodness in the midst of tremendous challenge, tremendous crisis, those things that we don't really anticipate happening, but actually are part of the path uh, that God has chosen for us. So for us, this happened about 19 years ago, actually, and we had four children, ages five and under, and I was pregnant with our fifth child. And we were very excited about this new baby, and I was 34 weeks pregnant when all of a sudden the baby stopped moving. And, you know, they always tell you to kind of watch for that. And I wasn't super worried about it, but it was of concern. I mentioned it to Matt on Sunday after church, and he said, well, do you want to go into the hospital? I'm like, no, I'm sure it's fine. I'll, I have an OB appointment coming up. I'll just go in tomorrow and, and, and talk to her about it. So I went into the appointment, and everything checked out fine, although just as I was getting ready to go, I told her that I was a little concerned, and she said, well, it's not like you to be worried. Let's, let's do some tests. So she did some tests right there in the doctor's office, and then she said, well, let's go to the hospital and do some more testing. I thought, okay, and I still was pretty, pretty calm that I remember. And 
they did some more testing there. Then all of a sudden, things kind of started happening. Some nurses started filling my room, and um, I could feel the buzz going around in the mm-hmm. in the hospital. And and then this nurse comes over to me. She goes, well, we're going to have a baby today. So I was 34 weeks pregnant, so I wasn't ready to have a baby. And Matt wasn't with me. I was actually by myself. Uh, actually, my cousin had been with me. And um, I said, well, let me call my husband and, and just let him know what's happening. Hey, everyone, you might remember that we recently mentioned an an author, Nikki Hardy, who's written a new book called Breathe Again. Really, today's podcast is a lot about some of the things that she covers in her, well, frankly, the central message that she covers in her book about the trauma that you face and in her particular circumstances, her mother got cancer and died, then her sister got cancer and died, and then she got cancer. And this book is speaking to the heart of that moment of trauma that every one of us is going to face at some point. Yeah, this is just the kind of book that I needed, wanted when we were going through our time with Avonlea. Just those, an encouragement, practical steps, things you can do, ways you can think when you are facing crisis. So Nikki came to the end of herself and she was just faced with this choice. Am I just going to survive? Or can I find a way to thrive? And so Nikki reoriented her thinking and her focus on what she believed and what is true in the moment of crisis. And she found the way to thrive instead of just survive. And so we want to encourage every last one of you, go get a copy of Nikki's book. At some point, life's going to dish out something that you weren't planning on, that you didn't see coming. And Nikki does such a good job of helping you navigate that crisis and teaching you how you can not just be a victim of the crisis, but how you can be a victor in the crisis. And even if you're not in crisis yourself, but you, someone you love is going through a really hard time, this is a wonderful book to give as a gift at, in those times where you feel like, I wish I could help this person more. This is a way to help your friend or family that's, in, that's going through such hard things. Absolutely. So remember the author's name, Nikki Hardy, and remember the name of the book, Breathe Again. And we're going to get back to our own story, but this was such a great resource for people going through crisis. We wanted to make sure that we mentioned it today. But now we'll get back to the story of our own experience. Right. So I got I get this call from Lisa that we're having a baby today. I'm like, what? You know, so I just leave the house quickly. And I don't know what I, I can't even remember how I arranged for childcare at the time. Our kids were, we had four kids at home, six and under. And so I raced off to the hospital. So Matt came in and uh, immediately the, the hospital room was full of doctors and and, um, and anesthesiologists and just all the people. And I, I couldn't even think straight by that point. I was probably in, sh- in shock. And I just turned to Matt and I said, I, I, you make all the decisions. I, I can't do this. And so you um, said, yeah, we'll do the emergency C-section and let's go. And within within an hour, I think I had this baby. And oh, I don't think it was that long at all. It was, was No, no. It was just minutes. It was less than 15 minutes. Wow. It was all very fast. Yeah, they were, they were all set up and ready to roll, just waiting for the final go ahead. So, but when... The baby was born. I looked at her, and she looked just like all of our other kids. She just had that Jacobson look, and she's all wrapped up nice in her little blanket. And and I just felt this huge sense of relief, like, okay, she's tiny, but it's going to be okay. And they, the doctors assured us. They said, well, we need to take her into the NICU and just check her out because she was born, you know, six weeks early, and we just want to make sure everything's good. And uh, they took me to a recovery room, and there I was in the recovery room. Matt came in with me, and we kind of talked about the day and what happened and how fast everything happened. And mm-hmm. and frankly, at that point, had no indication that there was anything untoward, just that, hey, there's some slight anomalies here and there. We're just checking this out. It was all very low-key, and we did not allow ourselves at all to get worked up about it. In fact, that's kind of an MO for even how we are, mm-hmm. um, you know, drive a truck through the living room and we're not going to overreact. So <laughs> so we literally just kind of took it as it came and, yeah, and I, weren't really anticipating anything. We had four healthy kids. There's no reason to think that this child isn't going to be perfectly healthy. Yeah, there's no no reason to get too worried about it. And so uh, Matt went home to be with our other kids for a little bit, just get them started some dinner, get some further child care before he would come back to be with me in the hospital. And I was, meanwhile, I was waiting for them to bring my baby back in. I had had all my other babies at the same hospital. I knew the routine. I knew that they would 
how they'd bring your baby in. They were really good about that. And But nobody was coming in to see me, like nobody. And I just had this major surgery, so it was a little bit odd after a while. And then finally, one of the nurses came in from the NICU, and she came in, and she was just very grave in her spirit. And she sat down on the edge of my bed, and she kind of patted my my ankle and said, well, nobody wants to come in here and talk to you. I thought, well, that was a weird way to start a conversation. Well, and, and where was the doctor, right? I mean, just we're yeah, she you said, know, we're just not right. understanding. You weren't understanding what in the world is going on. Yeah. And by then, I was no, I could tell that something was yeah. was off. And she said, nobody wants to tell you because we don't know what's what's happening, but you need to know that there's something terribly wrong with your little baby. And that's when I was just devastated. Mm -hmm. And I called Matt up and and I was just in tears and just said, there's something wrong with our baby. You've got to come, come quick. Yeah. So I just, I hopped in the car, raced to the hospital and uh, walked in and then we waited some more. And we were there alone in the room, except I think um, cousin Carrie was there, mm-hmm. and uh, and and she waited outside I think for a lot of it. But then she also was in the room as well. And it's a little it's nineteen years ago. It's a little blurry back and forth. But we waited, we waited, and we waited some more. And then finally, um, now again we're being fairly stoic about it, simply because the Bible says don't borrow trouble, you know, from from tomorrow. There's enough trouble. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So I wasn't prepared to just say, hey, you know, this is a nuclear disaster and wow, we really need to overreact. We just need to stay calm, trust the Lord. We don't know what the next move is. We're just going to wait until we know. And so that was my posture. So you were calmer than I was. I wasn't a wreck, but I was very worried by then. Yeah, absolutely. So all of a sudden this doctor we had never seen before comes into the room. So not the doctor that delivered the baby. And, you know, looking back on it and recognizing the trauma of the whole circumstance. It, it, this was a doctor that Lisa had a great relationship. They, yeah, they we were, we were re- friends. reasonably close yeah. and friends. And she just could not come and deliver the news. So another doctor agreed to do this for her. He walked in and we're going, well, hello, you know, I didn't recognize him. And he said, well, um, I just want to uh, tell you that your baby has had a massive hemorrhage, a massive brain hemorrhage. And your child uh, will not respond to you, will not walk, will not talk, will not know you. And I'm sorry, and we don't even know. Yeah, if she lives at all. If she's going to live at all. So in other words, the extent of the damage being uh, leading to death. But if she lives, Mm -hmm. she will be a vegetable. Mm -hmm. And so at that point, I kept it together and... Um, just the good soldier that I am. And I said, well, thank you, doctor. I'm sure it couldn't have been easy for you to come and deliver this news to us, but thank you. And so he left. And folks, it's 19 years ago, but I'm telling you, it's so fresh. Mm -hmm. This pain, this trauma, this circumstance where all of your hopes, your dreams, uh, your, your desires for your little girl are just crushed and washed away in one moment Mm -hmm. of uh, description of what has happened. So I turned to Lisa and we looked at each other and we just broke down and sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. It was so devastating. It was so unexpected, right? Uh, So devastating, so without reason so out of the blue and yet there we were dealing with this trauma and um, And our hearts were just breaking and our hearts were breaking so so um, after Matt just held me and we just cried and cried together and and everything in my mind was just swirling around I couldn't even think straight and and he he said through his tears, he said, no, you know what we were going to do next, don't you? And uh, I said, no, but I was just thankful that that he was going to take us somewhere and, and make things clear. And he just kneeled down beside my hospital bed 
and just started praying and thanking God for this circumstance. Now, trust me when I say that everything in me, my, my, my flesh, uh, my, my breaking heart is screaming against this message, right? But see, it's in this it's in it's in the darkness of a trial that we discover what we really believe. And I had taught Lisa and I both had taught mm-hmm. and spoken and uh, and and uh, led people in the instruction of the word that says God is loving, God is kind, um, God has His purposes for you. Sometimes we don't understand them. But his purposes are unfolding in the experiences and the events of our lives that he is working out his sovereign will and he is good and we are to yield our hearts to him. Well, it's easy to sing praise songs on Sunday morning when you're with everybody worshiping and the band is playing a great tune and everybody's just in the mood to worship and the sky is blue and it's all great. It's much tougher when the sky turns black. And I don't know if you've had a moment in your life when the sky has turned black. But we have to decide, are we going to be biblical Christians? Because to be a biblical Christian isn't to make strong assertions about the goodness of God when everything is good. To be a biblical Christian is to hold on to your faith when everything is bad, when it turns black. And I knew what I had told others. And as if the Lord was speaking to my spirit in that moment, he was saying to me, what do you really believe now? Mm -hmm. And so I knew I had to get on my knees sobbing, get on my knees, holding Lisa mm-hmm. and saying, Lord, I believe you, though in my spirit, the darkness, er, er, in my soul, the darkness is so heavy. And this is so hard and it hurts so much. But I'm not going to shake my fist at you. And I'm not going to second guess you. I'm going to say thank you. Because I know that I must. We don't know what God's going to ask you to walk through. We don't know what God's going to ask you to face. We don't know the path that you have walked, the trauma that you have experienced, the bad things that have come into your life. But God is calling us to have faith. What good is faith when the sun is shining? That's not when we find out uh, whether our faith can stand the test of real life. Anybody can be spiritual when the sun is shining. But what's the test of your faith when the dark clouds of adversity roll in, when the things that you couldn't imagine happening to you happen. And I know there are people listening right now who have had really bad things happen to them. And in your flesh, you're screaming out, where are you, God? Your flesh is screaming, where were you when I wasn't protected? Where were you when my spouse did whatever my spouse did? Where were you when my best friend died? Where were you when I was a little child and there was nobody to protect me? Well, the word of God is either true or it is false. And this is where faith comes to meet us in the darkest moments of our lives And either God is true to his word or he isn't. And it is left up for us to choose to believe. The Bible says 
in Romans 8, 28, that all things work together for good to them that love God, who are the called according to his purpose. It doesn't say all the good things work together for good. It says all things work together for good. See, I know that verse. I've memorized that verse. I've quoted that verse a thousand times to people prior to our little Avonlea being born. And here was a thing that was so ugly and so bad. Why? That's what our flesh wants to ask. We want to we want to just rebel against this circumstance. But God says all things, and that means the worst things that have happened to you, the worst things that are happening to you, and the worst things that are going to happen to you. They work together for good. But we have to be willing to trust God with those bad things. You see, the Bible speaks of a time, in, and it's in Revelation 21, verse 4, when every tear is going to be wiped away. So never mind all those people who say, oh, well, you know, the bad things are really the good things because it gives God an opportunity to work. You know what? If they're so good, then why at the end of all things does Jesus come to wipe those tears away? And he's going to wipe your tears away. But will you let him? Will you trust him with the bad things that have happened? Romans 8, 28 says, all things work together for good to them that love God, who are the called according to his purpose. Do you love God? Not on Sunday morning when you're singing worship songs with everybody. Do you love God in the valley? Do you love God in the darkness? Do you love God when it just doesn't make sense? So our Avonlea is 19 now, and... She does talk by God's miraculous grace. <laughs> she talks nonstop, in fact. <laughs> She's a little, little chatterbox, and she does know us and calls us mom and dad and can communicate. She's in a wheelchair. She cannot walk, but, and she really only has pretty much the use of one hand, um, but gets along pretty well in her little electric wheelchair and has learned to eat and drink and... Um, and she's memorized everybody's birthdays. <laughs> and she memorized everybody's <laughs> birthday. And she's a delight. And um, and every day is a mix of grief and joy with her. She brings so much joy to our life, and her faith is amazing. And her determination to get up each morning and to try again is so inspiring. And yet it's mixed with grief, too, because we know that it's not how... It should have been, and... Um, and she knows now. It's not how it should have been. Yeah. And I just can't help but thinking so much of life is like that. It's a mix of joy and grief. It's not just one or the other. It's both. And just yesterday my, morning, she had a pretty bad seizure the last day of our family vacation, and we were all around together um, having our last cup of coffee in the morning, and she had the seizure, and she just cried and shook and Matt just held her tight while she until the seizure was over and and afterwards it's just it it wipes her out and we were all a little bit just sad that about her suffering and then she was sitting on the patio furniture next to one of her sisters and the song I could only imagine came on and she started singing along and I can only imagine and just the truth of the lyrics of that song about what will be someday and will I dance in heaven and hearing her sing those songs in her, her little girl faith was, it's just so true. And it's how we each have to live, whether you're Avonlea in a wheelchair or you are suffering your own trials or, or crisis. You know, the, in John 9, 1 through 3, it recounts the story of the man who was born blind 
And everybody's looking for an explanation of why this is. Why did this happen? Did this guy sin or did his parents sin? Because that was the calculus back then of bad things happening. It must be because you did bad things or because someone did bad things and somehow that payment is being worked out in the bad things that are happening as a result. And Jesus answers, goes, no, <laughs> no, <laughs> this didn't happen to him because he did something bad or his parents did something bad. He's born blind so that God's glory can be revealed. So again, you know, that's, that's a verse that, you know, when, when we think of Avonlea, who now, even now wishes, you know, she could run when she sees other kids running and playing. And she leans over to me and whispers that in my ear, telling you, I hold on to that verse. John 9, 1 through 3, those verses. Because... I want to believe, I want to maintain my faith that God's glory is going to be revealed and is being revealed. And then the, the revelation verse that the tears are going to be wiped away. So, yep, we're still mom and dad. We still have our moments of, of sadness at, you know, the results of, you know, of, of, a, of a broken and fallen world. But we have confidence and hope in God. And we believe and... We just want to encourage you, whether you've faced tremendous trauma, whether you're in tremendous tragedy or darkness right now, or for those times that you may well face in the future, we want to encourage you, choose faith, yield your heart to God, and trust that what he says is true. And you know, he's going to set the record straight. And so what we tell Avonlea, these days is we tell her the beautiful truth that we're all going to get a new body one of these days. He is going to change our vile body into his glorious body. So he wants us to have faith. So hold on to what God has said. Be a biblical Christian and receive the strength that God has for you. And sometimes, you know, when you're going through your trials, you meet people that just go, and, and they can say the most inopportune things, and they mean well. But they say, oh, I can never do it. I can never do that. Or, wow, I don't know how you do it, or whatever. God never gives you the grace for somebody else's trials. But he will give you the grace for the trial that he asks you to walk through. So embrace his best. Receive his plan and have faith on the path that he has asked you to walk. So a few takeaways for today. One, God is there in the boat like he was with the disciples during the storm. He's with you. God expects me to have faith that what he has said is true. God has a purpose beyond our ability to see or to understand. And remember, he will wipe away every tear one of these days. <laughs> Praise God. Hey, thanks for joining us today on the podcast. Wow, that was kind of rugged for us. <laughs> we hope it was a blessing for you. Um, but yeah, when every time we sort of dip into this uh, story and, you know, it's, it's a 19-year-old saga that continues. And so it's always fresh for us. But anyway, we hope it was a blessing to you. Listen, if you enjoyed the podcast, uh, would you please share it on social media? It's as easy as taking a, a screenshot and just sharing that. Uh, as you get opportunity on whatever platforms you're on. And we would also ask, would you please leave a review uh, on whatever platform it is that you're listening on? Uh, just write a review. Those are so helpful. And of course, the five stars are uh, uh, reviews are wonderful too. But those written reviews are really powerful just to communicate how people are enjoying the podcast. And we do really appreciate that. And then one last thing, if you would like to uh, be a partner with us and uh, help us to continue what we're doing and you would like to be with us on that journey financially, please go to faithfulman.com. There's a donate button on the menu bar and just follow the uh, prompts there for whatever it is that is on your heart 
to give and be part of what we're doing. But thank you very much for those who have already done that. It's a massive blessing and enabling us to continue, and we really appreciate it. Wow. Thanks so much for joining us today on this journey. Remember, our God is our rock and our redeemer. And he already knows what you've been through. He knows what this week holds. And he knows exactly what you're facing. He loves you and is for you. So draw near to God. Draw near to God this week, and he will draw near to you.